Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, and if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby, and welcome. So today's video is a little bit different because it includes two cases, but one is technically not really a case. It's basically two mysteries in one. It's kind of confusing, but you'll know what I mean when we get into it. But the first case is one that I came across quite a while ago and kind of put it to the side like I do with a lot of cases and then I came back to it and when I really started diving into the case I realized that there was a whole another mystery connected to the first one and both of them happen years and years apart it's very strange and I don't think I've ever come across a case quite like this usually when there's two cases in one they happen kind of close together but these were far apart from each other in years and it's just very coincidental and very sad of course but um, with all that being said let's just get into it The first case I'm going to be discussing is the case of Amber Renee Barker. Now, Amber Renee Barker is a missing little girl, and her missing persons case is a lot like other people's missing persons cases, where she was on her way home and she vanished. Amber was a 10-year-old little girl. She had beautiful, big brown eyes and gorgeous brown hair to match. She was a child with her entire life ahead of her. But now, her photo and story sit on websites like the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and the Charlie Project, websites that help spread the word about cases like hers in the hopes of someday giving a conclusion to them. Her number on NCMEC is 841456, but there is an entire story behind that number. Amber's story began on October 14, 1987, the day she was born. The day she disappeared was December 18, 1997, but that isn't where her story ends because this case still remains open after almost 22 years. Amber lived in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and on the day of December 18, 1997, she was at her friend's house. Now, a little bit before 6 p.m., I want to say somewhere around 5.40 to 5.45, she was on the phone with her mother. This phone call did not last long, and basically the whole point of this phone call was her mother telling her to get home before dark, that it was going to get dark soon, and she wanted her to be on her bike on her way home very soon. This is something that Amber did quite often. She would ride her bike to her friend's house. They didn't live too far away from each other, a little bit of a distance, but not too far. And then before dark, she would ride her bike back home. So she hopped on her bike like her mother wanted her to do, and she started making her way back home. She left her friend's home not long after, and was last seen riding her 10-speed blue bike in the 3000 block Northwest 45th Street, while on her way home to the 3100 block of Northwest 39th Street, she vanished. She never made it home, and her mother soon experienced a mother's worst fear. Amber was never seen from again, but her bike was. It was found the next day in Deniston Park near Northwest 27th Street and Drexel Boulevard, only about a mile from her home. The next day after that, on December 20th, 1997, her sweater, one shoe, one sock, and her ring was found along Drexel Boulevard and Northwest 12th Street. The weird thing is that one of her shoes was found with these other belongings in that area, and then her other shoe was found blocks and blocks away. I was thinking how odd it is that one of her shoes was with the other belongings, and then her other shoe was blocks and blocks away. Now, I'm not exactly sure how this could have happened. I mean, possibly she lost one shoe, and then she was trying to ride away from her abductor, and then when she got abducted, the person took her other shoe off and took her sweater off, left the ring, left some of her belongings so people would find it eventually. Possibly they realized that her one shoe was gone so they decided to just get rid of the other one and her sweater in one location because they didn't want to go back for the other shoe because somebody might see them. I don't understand the psychology behind this because it doesn't really look like the sweater was tore off of her. It wasn't really ripped. so. This 
doesn't really make much sense. They discovered blood, hair, and fibers on her belongings. There were blue fibers and vomit on her sweater. A tiny speck of blood was found on a shoe. This speck was too tiny to attempt to link it to anyone, but with the evidence on the sweater, they were able to form a DNA profile of an unknown man linked to what they found. There was one suspicious individual that they kind of started looking at first, and that was Daniel John Smith, who was Amber's older sister, Debbie's common-law husband. Daniel John Smith, 24 years old, had a past, he had a record. He had been convicted of attempting kidnapping two years earlier in 1995. He admitted to being intoxicated on one occasion and trying to steal a woman's car keys. This woman's story of what happened was a little bit more intense, stating he tried to take advantage of her. He pleaded guilty and was sentenced to five years deferred prison sentence and four months of boot camp. Only one month before Amber's disappearance, the police were called to Debbie's residence because of Smith's behavior. Amber's sister called the police because her husband became violent with her after she refused to get intimate with him that night, and he hit her. He was given a citation. There are a few red flags when it comes to Daniel John Smith. The first one is that it was claimed that he was at Amber's residence when Amber was on the phone with her mother, Bonnie. The person that claims this also claimed that not long after the phone call ended, Daniel left the house and that usually when he leaves the house, he heads east, but this time he headed west, which if he was heading west, he would have crossed paths with Amber. He was interviewed not long after and he said that he had no involvement in Amber's disappearance, he had nothing to do with it, but police wanted to question him again about it. They never got to because he was found on December 22nd, 1997, hanging from a tree in Ray Trent Park in Dell City, Oklahoma at around 11.30 p.m. He had taken his own life only four days after Amber's disappearance. He was not labeled as a suspect in the case at the time, but police really, really wanted to question him further, and he knew that. This next part of the case gets a little bit confusing, but I'm going to try to make it as easy to understand as possible. Now, the person that claimed that Daniel was at Amber's house when Amber was on the phone with her mother, Bonnie, was a man named Joey Bishop. Joey Bishop was also at the house because he was dating Amber's other older sister, Brandy. When Bonnie, Amber's mother, was asked about speaking to Amber on the phone and if during this time Daniel was at the house, she said no. She said Daniel was at the house that day, but it was way earlier before the phone call happened. When Daniel himself was questioned about this, he said that he was in fact at the house when Amber was on the phone with her mother, Bonnie, that he witnessed this whole thing and that he did leave the house heading west. And he said the reason that he was heading west instead of east was he was going to find Debbie, couldn't find her anywhere and decided to go out drinking for the night. It's very odd in this story that actually Joey and Daniel kind of have the same agreement of what happened, but Bonnie, the main person who kind of would have known if somebody else was in her house at the time that she was on the phone with her daughter, says that he wasn't there at the time. It just, it doesn't make much sense. Another thing that makes Smith look a bit suspicious is that blue fibers were found on Amber's belongings, and he did in fact have blue cloth seats, blue carpet, and a blue vinyl dashboard in his pickup truck, the one he was driving the day Amber went missing. When Amber's mother was asked in an interview in 2008 about her opinions on Daniel John Smith, she said, yeah, I definitely think he's responsible. Then goes on to say, I believe there's somebody else involved besides him that knows something. The somebody that she's referring to may have been Forrest J. Rice, an inmate at the Oklahoma City Correction Center. He admitted to police that Daniel John Smith was actually at his apartment the night that Amber disappeared and that he was also with him earlier on in the day before Smith took his own life. Forrest J. Rice never came forward with any more information though involving the case. At the time of her disappearance, Amber Renee Barker was 10 years old. She was in the fourth grade at the time and attended James Monroe Elementary School. She had brown eyes and brown hair. She was 4 feet 11 inches tall and weighed about 70 to 80 pounds. 
The day she went missing, she was wearing a long sleeve beige shirt with a brown collar and a pair of jeans. If she were alive today, she would be 31 years old. If you have any information regarding her disappearance, you are urged to call the Oklahoma City Police Department at 405-297-1009. You can stay anonymous. Amber's sister, Brandy's ex-boyfriend, Joey Bishop, was questioned in January of 2015 and he told News 9 in Oklahoma, the whole family was questioned. Everyone was questioned, taken down to the police station and polygraphed and all that. He claims he had no idea what happened to Amber and whatever happened to her was most likely taken to the grave with Daniel John Smith. He says he still has nightmares about the entire thing. Like I said, in 1997, Joey Bishop was dating Amber's other sister, Brandy. Now, Joey and Brandy had a very toxic relationship. And from what I read, it kind of wasn't either of their faults. They just didn't mesh well. They just didn't get along and they fought all the time. So they decided to end things and separate finally and move on in life. Brandy though has an entire mystery surrounding her and I didn't even come across this the first time I was researching into this case and then when I read into it I couldn't even believe what happened. Brandy K. Perry was described as a fun loving person. She was the kind of person who always had everyone in the room laughing. She could have been a comedian. She could have a dollar to her name and she'd still try to give it to somebody if she could help. She was an animal lover and one of her favorite hobbies was making jewelry. Sometimes though, good people can get involved in the wrong crowd and that's what happened with Brandy. This may have been what was responsible for the sudden end of her life. In spring of 2013, a huge storm made its way through Oklahoma. It was very devastating. It was, it was a monster and it claimed the lives of around 20 people. There was a lot of damage with this storm but it didn't really affect the area of Wewoka, Oklahoma. The storm did not claim anyone's life in Wewoka, Oklahoma. It just didn't really affect this area. The storm didn't really pass through it. They just got some rain, some wind, and that was about it. But the day after the storm, Brandy's body was found in a ditch outside of her house with just a little bit of water in the ditch and she was weirdly surrounded by clothing. The place she was living was a travel trailer, which we all know a trailer is easily affected by storms, but there wasn't really much damage to the trailer. Examiners admitted that this whole thing was very weird, but they said that she was simply a victim of the storm. She said, no one else in the area died from the storm. I don't know how they got she was a storm victim. Bonnie doesn't think the storm is to blame and neither does her other sister, Debbie. Chief Deputy Chris Kahn of the Seminole County Sheriff's Office said he doesn't believe she was a victim of the storm. He said that she was found lying in barely any water and the area she was living in did not flood that day during the storm. He said she had some sort of head injury. She definitely fell and hit her head, but it doesn't seem like it was because of the storm. Brandy was one of those people that was just so full of life. Everybody in the room was kind of just drawn to her. She could make anyone laugh. She just had this amazing personality, but she also dealt with her demons. And one of those demons was substance abuse. And the other thing that she really dealt with was she was very attracted to men who did not treat her right. She mostly gravitated towards men who were quite abusive and only about a month before her body was found, her boyfriend at the time had cut her neck and beat her up very, very badly. Brandy was definitely going through a lot at the time. She was living in a travel trailer on a property that was owned by an older man who had been in the hospital for weeks. Her relationship with her boyfriend was very toxic from the beginning. Her sister Debbie said he would lead her on, act like he was interested in spending time with her, and then just drop her off somewhere. He lied to her all the time and physically mistreat her. In May, before the storm occurred, she was supposed to receive her disability check. It never came and she was trying hard to save up money to get back to Oklahoma City. 
The day that they found Brandy's body, coincidentally her boyfriend or her ex-boyfriend had called her mother Bonnie and asked where Brandy was and Bonnie told him it's too late and hung up on him. It's just kind of a coincidence that something so tragic happened twice in one family. When it comes to Amber's case, her case is a very, very touchy subject because it involves an array of different sensitive topics. Daniel John Smith was not looked at as a suspect. They simply thought that there was a few things suspicious about him and they wanted to question him again and he decided to take his own life because of this. He had not been known to suffer from depression, really, from anything that I read. People didn't see that this was going to be something that he was going to do. It does look like the fact that police were going to question him again about Amber's disappearance is the reason that he decided to take his life, which all in all looks obviously very, very suspicious. There have been quite a few cases on my channel where a person was going to be questioned again or they were a suspect and not long after they take their life. And of course, that's very sad if they didn't commit the crime, but it doesn't make much sense if they were innocent for them to do such a thing right after this happened. From an outsider standpoint, even if you don't research into these cases very deeply, it does kind of look like they are guilty and that they know they're going to get caught and instead of facing the time in jail that they deserve they would rather just end their life there have really been no new leads when it comes to amber's case they haven't really been able to do anything with the blood on her sweater it just kind of hit a dead end when it comes to brandy her case is not really considered a case because it was determined that she was just simply a victim because of the storm that passed through Oklahoma in 2013. The main thing that is so strange about Brandy's case is that, yes, if a storm came through and she was outside, maybe the wind would have pushed her and she could have fallen and hit her head. That doesn't seem that far-fetched, but the fact that her clothes were spread around her when her body was found. I was trying to think of different ways that this could have happened and the only thing that I could really think of is that maybe somebody came to the house, was trying to get her out of this trailer and telling her to leave and maybe they were throwing her belongings at her, like throwing her clothes, starting with the clothes and they pushed her down and she hit her head and they decided to just leave. I know that sounds very weird, but that's the only thing that I could think of unless somebody did something to her and just decided to go in the house, grab her clothes and surround her with them. Just like Amber's case, everything with Brandy didn't really go anywhere else. I couldn't find any more articles. It kind of just ended with that. And that's very unfortunate. And I hope that something can be resolved when it comes to Amber's case or Brandy's case, hopefully both of them. Brandy passed away in 2013 in, of course, a very suspicious way, and Bonnie, which is Amber, Brandy, and Debbie's mother, passed away a year later in 2014. I'm not a mother myself, but my heart goes out to any mother or father or anyone who has had anyone around them pass away in a very strange manner and it not be solved or be abducted and it never be solved. Like I could not imagine what that does to anybody, but especially a parent. Going through years and years of stress obviously takes years off your life. It takes time off of your life and how much you have left on this earth. And for Bonnie to go through so many years of not knowing what happened to Amber and then having this happen to her other daughter, I think that's what kind of deteriorated her health and deteriorated her mental state, which of course is insanely heartbreaking. But this is a video that I really, really want to hear your all's opinions on. I wanna hear what you all come up with because I sat there scratching my head for so long about everything having to do with Amber's case and what happened to Brandy. With Amber, obviously most 
fingers point to Daniel John Smith, but the fact that nothing else has come of this, and if he was guilty, he just ends his life and that's it. With Brandy, before this happened, she was in a relationship that involved a lot of domestic violence, and I find that too coincidental that domestic violence was going on and then she passes away a month later after a huge incident. Like I said, let me know your thoughts below. If I find out any more information about this case, if I'm able to talk to somebody in the family, I really want to try to get in contact with Debbie, the other sister, and see what she has to say about it. This is a video that I would love to do a part two on, but until then, if I am able to do that, leave your thoughts down below and I will see you all in the next video. Bye guys.